I've been studying hemochromatosis for the last three years since I found out I had two HFE gene mutations. And one thing that surprised me immediately was that there was a lot of controversy about many aspects of hemochromatosis. And this video is part one of several videos examining those controversies. But today I'm asking the question, can a carrier, that's someone with just one HFE gene mutation, overload iron? Hemochromatosis has been known about for 150 years, and yet it appears it is still not at all well understood even today. In fact, it has a history of being incorrectly explained. In, even in 1935, Dr. Joseph Sheldon published a book which accurately described the late symptoms of hemochromatosis, but gave the reason for the disease as a metabolic disorder resulting from the lower stomach enterocytes absorbing more iron than they needed. There was a different group in the same period, as late as 1963, that believed that, a, that hemochromatosis was primarily associated with too much alcohol consumption. Alcohol does increase iron loading, but so to do other things like vitamin C during eating. And it is now understood that it is not the primary cause, as they thought then. It was not until the 1990s that a genetic link was established. And the concept of it being a recessive condition, requiring two mutations, one from each parent, for it to be active, Although two mutations does give a strong effect in hemochromatosis, it is now known there is a weak effect when only a single mutation is present. But this fact from scientific measurement is today so unknown that most experts still claim ca a carrier cannot overload. So the history of not fully understanding hemochromatosis continues in this controversial subject even today. The study of genetics has rapidly changed over the last 20 years and I think it's because 20 years is not so long in scientific discovery terms that some groups have not kept pace with this rapid change. In this video I'm going to concentrate just on this single aspect. This is so controversial that it's going to take me this whole video to discuss it even though I can tell you now, yes, there is irrefutable scientific evidence that between 1 and 2% of carriers do overload iron because, at least in part, because of one HFE gene mutation. Now, even if an expert accepts that a carrier can overload iron, in general, they'll say it's because of a non-HFE gene mutation. In other words, it has nothing to do with them being a carrier. But the scientific evidence is irrefutable that a carrier can overload and the data also shows that it is because of the HFE gene. I can tell you that many researchers and doctors, including all of the world's hemochromatosis organisations, refute these statements. But also, to muddy the waters a little, many of these organisations, including the UK's Hemochromatosis UK, are also inconsistent in their wording, so much so they make contradictory statements about this fact. So let's start with the meaning of the terms involved. I know this is a bit boring and formal, but I think part of the problem is the meaning of the words used and inconsistently used. The worst word is actually the word hemochromatosis itself. Let's go to the Hemochromatosis UK site and see what they say hemochromatosis is. So it says here hemochromatosis is the body uh, accepting too much iron and the extra iron is stored in the organs or soft tissue and this is hemochromatosis or iron overload. So this is good, it's clear, isn't it? Basically, my summary is hemochromatosis is synonymous with 
iron overload of the organs and soft tissues. So most of the time I'll call this iron overload and it's not too much ferritin in the blood, it's too much iron in the organs. Okay, now let's see what Hemochromatosis UK say about hemochromatosis and genetics. And it says, having genetic hemochromatosis means you have two copies of specific HFE gene mutations, one from each parent, and you are loading iron. Okay, they say you have to have two mutations to have hemochromatosis. And since they say hemochromatosis and iron overload are synonymous, then it means carriers cannot load. But their FAQs actually say something slightly different. In the question, do carriers have to worry about symptoms? It actually says some carriers will load iron and exhibit symptoms. Though the inheritance pattern recessive and the mutations involved in hemochromatosis are well researched, there is evidently other factors at play which are not fully understood. The incidence of iron overload in people with the mutated genes is referred to as penetrance of the disease and is not properly researched in any of the possible scenarios described above. So we concluded carriers cannot overload and here it says some will load but that is the case that has not been properly researched. This is a bit of a mess, isn't it? Because there's still a lack of understanding and some ignorance as to the published scientific data. The hemochromatosis organisations are not addressing the elephant in the room. In a moment I'll show there is nearly as many carriers exhibiting iron overload as there are two mutation people having iron overload and that this is because even though the proportion of carriers will overload is low, the number of carriers is actually very high. The result is, because of these organisations are only respecting about 56% of the people who actually have iron overload, and therefore hemochromatosis, this is a bit of a scandal. These hemochromatosis organisations only support 56% of the people suffering from the condition they purport to be supporting, ignoring 44% that also suffer iron overload because they incorrectly believe they are a tiny edge case. Someone in Hemochromatosis UK said to me that they did an expert review of this carrier situation and the expert said HFE carriers could experience elevated ferritin strokes transfer in SAT percentage, but this was not caused by HFE mutation itself. A number of factors were cited, including compound heterogosity of an unknown or unrecognized non-HFE mutation, lifestyle factors and other causes unrelated to HFE mutations. Okay, I think this is the problem because when HFE gene was discovered in 1996 they concluded the mutations were recessive and that the HFE gene was the only gene involved in hemochromatosis. This has locked them into thoughts which clearly are not supported by today's scientific measurements. Let's listen to Dr. Paul Adams, who is associated with Canada's hemochromatosis organization. The typical hemochromatosis patient, they almost all have exactly the same genetic mutation. And that's not true with most genetic diseases. If you took like cystic fibrosis, there are hundreds of different genetic mutations that are close in the same region, but they're not exactly the same. But in hemochromatosis, most people have exactly the same genetic mutation. So that means when you're developing a genetic test, you only have to zero in on one little spot. Well, he points out that most genetic diseases involve lots of genes and mutations. But then he says hemochromatosis is special. 
in that it involves just the one HFE gene. Well, he was right about the other genetic conditions, but not about hemochromatosis. This is wrong. It does involve other genes for everyone, whether they have two HFE mutations or one. OK, so I'll show that the HFE gene really is involved with carriers. Here is the proof. On the left, we have people with no mutations, and on the right, people with a single HFE H63D mutation. So if the reason why carriers load is a different unidentified mutation or some other gene, then the chances of iron overload for these two cases would be exactly the same. And yet, we see the chance is 2.2 times more for those with the single HFE gene. This shows that the HFE gene really is involved. Normally, I do not like criticising anyone, but the hemochromatosis organisations are working in the dim and distant past. The data I am using to prove my point was published 10 years ago. They need to catch up with the work done that long ago. And the work we are doing at Chakain gives even stronger confirmation of this. It's time for them to come into the modern world. They are concerned about awareness of hemochromatosis, but are lacking to the extent that hemochromatosis has in the world. So much so that they have no awareness themselves of the condition. If they embrace the 44% of sufferers who they do not accept exists, it could nearly double awareness of the condition overnight. How short-sighted are they? Just look at this table. Hemochromatosis UK say the number of people suffering from hemochromatosis in the UK is 380,000. My number for two mutations is 406,000, which is more or less close to th their 380. What is missing is the number for carriers, which amounts to 44% of all sufferers. So this is the tiny edge case that Hemochromatosis UK claim. The same table for the US looks like this. The source of the data for both tables comes from published scientific papers which are referenced in this video's YouTube description. In the US, the hemochromatosis organisations claim just one million sufferers, but if you see my data and add in the carriers, it actually becomes as much as 4.2 million. It's truly worth including everyone to increase awareness of this fully treatable disease which affects more people than you realise. I encourage all viewers of this video to approach their country's hemochromatosis organisations and complain that their thinking needs to be brought up to 2020 thinking. It's time to be fully inclusive. Clearly, knowing what genes you have is crucial. I've been running checkiron.com for the last 12 months. It analyzes raw DNA data from commercial providers such as Ancestry or 23andMe. It's free and anonymous to use. When we say that between 1 and 2% of carriers overload iron, how do you tell if you're in the 1 to 2%? Well, the experts will tell you it's not possible. But I will say try check iron because specifically we tell you what age we estimate you will load or overload based on your genes. We look at more than just the single HFE gene mutations. We currently look at 139 mutations and we use machine learning to make the calculation. Currently, the standard deviation on this calculation is plus or minus 12 years. We do what the experts say is impossible try us and see if we're right or wrong. For those that found this video useful,
please click the like button in YouTube and subscribe to the Iron Could Kill You channel for more videos like this one. Look forward to talking to you again soon.